Developers face a number of barriers when doing business in growth and emerging markets. There are significant linguistic and cultural differences as well as regulatory hurdles that can make it rather daunting for exporters. My next guest has over 25 years experience in international corporate, advisory and government roles that includes work in Beijing, Taipei and Shanghai. Joining me now to talk about doing business in growth and emerging markets is Director of International Operations at Austrade, Laurie Smith. How are you, Laurie? Hi, Peter. Great to join you. Same here, mate. Now, look, with, with the dollar no real help to local exporters, the pressure has to be on exporters to think outside the square, and that puts a lot of pressure on you guys as the, the, the helpers of, of lateral thinkers. Uh, what do your in-market advisors do to help exporters? Look, Peter, um, our real focus is on um, getting a team of savvy people in market. We've got around about 600 staff in 55 countries across 100 locations and, and their job really is to build strong networks to find opportunities for Australian companies and to give them sound advice and, and insights into what's happening in the market and really use the, the badge of government that our team carry to get access to gatekeepers and, and open doors that might otherwise be tough for companies to get into. Yeah, the interesting thing I found when I was reading one of your reports is that different countries actually require different attitudes and for example in, in an exporter trying to crack a market in Japan there are certain ways that work and certain things that don't. Sure look I, I've had um, personal experience working in Japan working in China and and I can see just amongst those those two neighbors you, you see quite marked differences in the way that that business counterparts tend to operate. Uh, in Japan, things take time, are very methodical, very cautious. There's a consultative process internally on the other side of the table. But once you d do get started, and it can take a while, you can build some very long-term relationships that can be very productive and, and very profitable. Uh, China, as you know, um, has been go-go for the last 20, 25 years during the reform period. Lots of churn, lots of new people coming into business, people wanting to do things and do things fast. So, so a bit, quiz bit, bit quicker to get started, but not necessarily quite as steady um, once you've got your first foothold in the market. Mm. So you do get a lot of different, um, different factors coming into play. Of course, there's cultural and linguistic barriers. The availability of knowledge can vary in different markets, and that's they're the sort of areas that we focus on providing support for Aussie companies. Now, Laurie, I know you're a very sober man, but I have been told in, in China and Japan, it's not a problem if you're willing to go out and socialise with potential business partners. Is this something that's a cultural thing, or is it something that's been exaggerated by Australians? Uh, no, look, I think there, there is that element to to doing business in, in a range of other cultures where um, relationships that, that have that, that exist and are formed and are strengthened outside the office and outside the, the meeting room can be pretty important. It's not just in Asia, I've got to say. I think in Latin America, um, trust and confidence is important in the Middle East. You know, that's, a, that's an environment where, where hierarchy is strong, uh, where, where the business partners on the other side of the table want to have confidence. Um, that they understand the people that they're dealing with. I think there's, there's a range of different markets overseas where you get a different texture and different nuance to, to the dynamics of building relationships and ultimately doing business. So obviously an exporter should, should come to you guys first before doing their pitch, at least if only to get the information about what you guys are saying about what generally works? Sure. No, we're all, that, our door is open. Um, you know, through the gateways we have here in Australia and in all of our offices overseas, we we're very happy to meet any Australian company that's that's looking to um, operate um, in an overseas market. And there's things we can do directly for them. We also try to build that strong network, as I said to you earlier, and and refer um, Australian companies on to other effective service providers in markets where we can't, you know, do everything. Obviously, that's impossible with restricted resources. We try to focus. Um, in the areas where we think we can make the most difference, but then have really good referral networks um, where we can can uh, introduce others who might be able to assist Australian companies. Now, Laurie, one of the things that's quite staggered I me, and I think a lot of my viewers might be staggered by it as well, that, that there's a, a growing market in the Middle East, 380 million potential customers, and 70% are under the age of 40, is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a young market. Um, I, I guess, you know, when you look at some of the political events that have been happening 
in the Middle East. Uh, and, you, and when you reflect on it, you, you have seen a lot of that that youth um, out there in the vanguard of a lot of those changes. Yeah, the Arab Spring that, thing. That's, yeah. that's not our space, but but uh, but as a market, certainly it's very young, it's fast growing, um, it's you know, buoyed up clearly by very high commodity prices, and we see great opportunities in traditional areas, obviously agricultural commodities, food, and so on, but also infrastructure, design, um, education. You know, Australia's um, Australia's international education sector is very strong. Promoting that is a key responsibility for Austrade and the Middle East um, is a very strong source of students for Australia and it really adds to the diversity um, of the student body down here. And you also have Aussie institutions that look to deliver courses and programs uh, offshore in markets like the Middle East, across Asia, um, and I think in the future Latin America will be no exception to that sort of mm. pattern. The, 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 the interesting thing I find, uh, Laurie, the more you get to know people who have operate in these markets, there are actual unique aspects of, of populations and the way they do business. For example, I'm often told that Indian business people often find it very hard to say no uh, and that can sometimes be a bit of a, a frustration in doing business with them. Is that something that is a, a common observation? Yeah, I, I think um, you know, it's, it's not an uncommon thing that sometimes Yes might mean maybe, uh, or it might mean I heard you, and maybe might mean no, mm. but you know I don't want to tell you right now. But you do get those sorts of nuances, um, and there's some broad generalisations between markets, and then there's also the individual factor, or you know is it a, is it a big uh, is it a big state-owned enterprise? Is it a more nimble uh, private sector company? You'll get a different culture and a different way of dealing with potential business partners, suppliers. Um, e even across those different types of institutions. Mm. So, so, so what you see is not always what you get. I, I, one last question, Laurie. If, if someone is contemplating the, the potential export markets out there, you know, does your website have examples of, of businesses that have cracked uh, contracts in these various markets? And, and those, those case studies, in a sense, would be a good uh, lesson for someone trying to get into these markets? Sure, Peter. Uh, yep, it's www.austrade.gov.au and we have got uh, quite a lot of basic introductory information about markets. We, we tell uh, readers about where our network is and you know, what, what assets we've got out there that might be useful and there are a lot of case studies as well that, that talk a little bit about how different companies, many SMEs um, you know, who really are the core of our client base, and what, what the secret for their success and the story of their success has been in a given market. And, and there's a lot of really interesting left field surprises there that I think uh, other exporters find very, very inspiring because I think there's a lot, a lot of learning and sharing goes on amongst the business community itself. Yeah. Um, and we're just, we're just one of the supporters for, for new companies or for companies getting into new frontiers in export. Laurie, thanks for joining us.